Great, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm gonna go over a few different examples of the trends that um, we're seeing on social media and that I have seen over the last even decade um, and which ones are growing and which ones seem to be getting better and which platforms are better. Um, but I'm gonna try to keep it brief uh, with the examples I have because I know that a lot of people have questions about how the networks work and how to respond and when to respond, if to respond. Um, so I'm gonna be as brief as I can. Um, just give me a second to, it looks like I'm not able to share the screen. Is that possible? Hold on, I'm just going to make you a co-host and then you should be able to. I mean, I know that the, the anti-Semitism online is unpleasant, but I do think it's important for you to see the examples, so. You should have controls there, Emily. You should be able to go, oh, there we go, fantastic. Great. All right, you guys can see? Full Somebody screen, give me absolutely. Yeah, you, we can see, thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about different examples and trends in anti-Semitism and then a little bit about the, the shortcomings and the pitfalls when it comes to like the terms of use and the community standards that if any of us are familiar with this issue even a little bit, we probably heard about some of the problems with that. Um, so first, first things first, um, there's a big problem on social media with white supremacism. Um, and this is something that's really built up in the last just couple of years, um, but we, we've seen different trends. Um, obviously, there's always been anti-Israel slash anti-Zionism type content on social media since social media grew. Um, but in recent years, we've really seen a push um, and a, I guess resurgence of white supremacists online. One of the things that they're using social media for is to build um, networks um, and to recruit other people um, and educate or miseducate, I guess, about the things that are important to them. Um, this is an example of the terrorist who carried out the attack in um, the United States not long ago, what he posted on social media before. This, a lot of times the, the white supremacists, their favorite platforms aren't the mainstream platforms. They're working on Gab, 4chan, um, and also Telegram to build groups. I myself was actually listed in a neo-Nazi group as uh, like Jews controlling something on social media. Um, a little bit scary, but uh, <laughs> but they use this a lot to, um, to, to recruit people and to get people worked up about different issues that are happening in the world. However, um, they're also using mainstream networks as well. Um, so I know that Facebook has recently tried to crack down on white supremacist groups and on, on neo-Nazi activity on social media, um, but so far we haven't seen very good results according to the research. Um, and this is just uh, some information that I pulled up a few days ago in some recent studies that were done, um, and they found that the majority of the of the white supremacist groups do have Facebook. They have an active Facebook presence, even after it's been reported. And even more than that, there's a lot of groups. They use groups more than they use pages because pages get reported and taken down or whatever. And for some reason, it's harder for Facebook, uh, until now, it's harder for Facebook to monitor what's going on um, in the groups. And sometimes they'll use a lot of different tactics to circumvent Facebook's algorithm, for example, um, if there are certain keywords that Facebook identifies, they'll put like a dollar sign instead of an S. So then it doesn't get triggered by the algorithm. So with every step that Facebook takes, um, the white supremacist groups also are taking other steps to get around it. Um, this is just an example of one of the one of the pages that is up still. Um, Facebook implemented a new policy where they tried to redirect people who are searching for neo-Nazi content. So like if they searched something like um, white pride or, or I don't know, it's not something I searched. So <laughs> I don't know exactly. Um, it would redirect them to like information that's counter to that. But unfortunately, because of how the algorithm works, that's not what's happened, at least until now. So even though they said this feature is something that they're rolling out, it hasn't worked until now. And that was in 2019. So we're already in June 2020, and it still doesn't work. Um, oops. Then we have then we have the other problem within Facebook's algorithm in that it's sort of a, it gives you content that it thinks you will like. So if you are someone who likes neo-Nazi content, 
Um, it gives you recommendations, which is crazy, but it gives you recommendations for other pages or other groups that they think you will like. So you can see here a screenshot of a nationalist um, page and the recommendations for it are the myth of white guilt, uh, white wing politics, and then another neo-Nazi group or, or far right group. So this in and of itself and the way that they've structured the algorithm is problematic. They're aware of it and yet still nothing has happened to deal with it at a high level. Um, then when it comes to uh, anti-Zionism versus anti-Semitism, this is obviously something that the neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups have latched onto. On social media in general for all groups, there's a big problem with them replacing the word Jews with Zionist or replacing criticism of uh, the Jewish people with the Jewish state. This is anti-Semitism. This is classic anti-Semitism. It's just using different words. Um, and a supreme example is the tweet from David Duke. It, this exemplifies so many problems with social media and anti-Semitism today in only one tweet. He was the KKK Grand Master Wizard, something crazy. I don't know exactly what the title was. He's a neo-Nazi. Um, and he tweeted about the coronavirus, um, are Israel and the global Zionist elite up to their old tricks? Obviously this is anti-Semitic and yet it still wasn't removed by Twitter um, and, until this day. He is allowed to proliferate this type of content on Twitter. Um, and even though this has been reported by just by people I know, probably a couple hundred times, um, it's not removed, he's not removed. Um, and there's, it's, it's very difficult to get these platforms to take action when there's content like this, where they sort of use different words, but what they actually mean is something anti-Semitic. And that's a big problem for anti-Semitism today. Um, obviously, when it comes to Israel and the BDS movement, anti-Zionism, anti we see similar trends on social media. Um, that goes for arts, you know, artists who come and play in Israel getting harassed. That goes for uh, campus groups and how they put out their content on social media. And also um, state policies uh, like Iran uses social media a lot um, to demonize Israel and to spread anti-Israel propaganda. This is just one example from the Scottish Palestinian Solidarity Committee um, of them comparing coronavirus to what Israel is doing. Um, I'll talk about this in a minute, but basically everything that happens in the world that isn't good somehow on social media almost immediately gets compared to Jews or compared to what Israel is doing in Gaza or everything is somehow related to Jews. Um, and this is just one example. This was up very early, uh, content like this was up very early in the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and it's continued to come out um, in English and in Arabic um, from uh, critics of Israel and especially BDS groups. Um, this is just a few examples that we see also on social media, uh, both from public figures and just general demonization of Zionists and what they really mean is Jews. <laughs> um, so Linda Sarsour, I'm sure most of you have probably heard about her if you're familiar with this area of pro-Israel advocacy. Um, so this is an, a classic anti-Semitic trope, dual loyalty. Um, but this type of content is never that I know of. It has never been taken down by a social media network, despite the fact that it's clearly proliferating anti-Semitic views. Um, and not only that, but if you look at the comments to posts like this, which I will show an example of later, it brings up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of straight textbook classic anti-Semitism. Um, another trend you see here, kind of what I was saying before, um, Zio is like a term that was used a lot in the UK to refer to uh, pro-Israel activists or, or Jews. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of content like this. Um, and you can see another tweet from David Duke sort of setting the standard um, for language that is more acceptable according to the social media terms. And then people emulate that over and over and over again. And the thing with social media is that um, it's, it, it is an echo chamber, but in addition to that, like the more something is talked about, the more people see it, which means the more people talk about it. So it's these networks unintentionally are proliferating anti-Semitic content when they refuse to A, take this issue seriously and B, remove the content when it's reported. Um, another trend that's um, been 
active as long as I've been in this field is uh, the comparison or the equation of Israel to Nazis. This is according to the IRA definition of antisemitism, antisemitism. Um, and you can see why here. Uh, obviously, you're placing the Star of David with a swastika is anti-Semitic. Still, this content wasn't removed. Um, the, the last I checked, at least, it may have been removed now. Um, and there's a lot of content that you see like this um, of when, you know, when issues come up with Israel or when there's political issues with Israel, you see that the response on social media from people, even if it's from like bot accounts or fake accounts, is anti-Semitic like this, or they'll respond. Um, I remember when, when Snapchat did a feature of, they used to highlight different cities every day um, for like that day. And they would pick like select photos of people in that area and highlight it globally. So one of the days they did Tel Aviv, not even Israel, just Tel Aviv. And the response across social media, which interestingly not on Snapchat's platform, but on Twitter, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of users just responded to Snapchat and to Snapchat's support account on Twitter with pictures of Hitler. Not criticism of Israel, just pictures of Hitler. So you can see again the, the you know, they love to say that, oh, well, it's anti-Zionism, it's not anti-Semitism, but we see over and over and over again on social media that that's simply not the case. Um, All right, we're back. You guys can see? Yep, we can see, full screen. Okay, so uh, moving on, that another trend that we've seen, especially in recent years that's increasing alarmingly quickly is um, state-sponsored anti-Semitism. Um, so we see a lot of this from Turkey. Um, in fact, Turkey is one of the largest, country, like largest uh, operations on Twitter of fake accounts um, and of organized content. And most of the time the content isn't really related to Israel, it's pro Erdogan. Um, and also uh, China does a lot of this activity on social media. And every once in a while you'll see an article come out as you know, Twitter removed 70,000 bot accounts that were traced back to Turkey or that were traced back to Iran. So we know that these states are very, very active um, in proliferating fake news. Um, and the content that they want to push like as their policies. Unfortunately, um, some of that for certain nations like Iran um, includes anti-Semitism. So we saw content like this with their annual um, Holocaust denial cartoon. Um, and then we saw this just a few weeks ago with the Ayatollah tweeting on Al-Quds Day um, about uh, the final solution. So um, this is another trend that seems to be increasing on social media. And then when it comes to current events, most recently we've had a lot of problems <laughs> with anti-Semitism and coronavirus and in just the last week or so um, with Black Lives Matter. Now it's important to note that not the Black Lives Matter uh, content itself, but with certain individuals who are responding to some of the problems um, and the issues of racism in the United States by attacking Jews. And I will give a few examples of that. So first with coronavirus, we saw a lot of stuff um, in English and in Arabic, including organized campaigns from the Arab world, comparing explicitly the coronavirus itself to Jews or to um, the state of Israel. We saw both. Um, and then we also saw a lot of stuff like the example I, I put here, exposing Zionist puppets worldwide. Obviously this is anti-Semitic. Last I checked, it was still up. Um, and then this post was talking about how uh, the rabbis are using the coronavirus to make money. It's nonsense, but it's obviously an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. And this type of content got huge traction um, on social media because as we know, anytime there's something that's unexplainable globally, uh, conspiracy theories tend to rise, especially on social media, in areas where there's no or, or relatively no fact checking and, and anyone can say anything. Um, another example of this type of content, I mentioned that there was a campaign in Arabic. Um, it was hashtag COVID-48, not 67, <laughs> the COVID-48. Um, in Arabic, uh, this was an organized campaign. I actually wrote about this a little bit to um, attack Israel and to compare Israel to the coronavirus and claim that Israel is operating like a virus. Um, then we also saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments like the screenshot I took here. Uh, of someone saying, what's the difference between coronavirus and Jews? Coronavirus does not kill children. 
There was a lot of content like this on social media, um, especially at the very beginning of the coronavirus, and it continued throughout. Um, now it seems to have died down a little bit because a lot of attention has been drawn to it through different articles. I know that the Israeli government also uh, was in touch with the social media networks about this problem. They issued a report on it. Um, so there are people fighting back and it's just constantly an uphill battle on social media. Now when it comes to the recent events with Black Lives Matter, despite the fact that most Jewish organizations um, came out very strongly in support of the Black community, um, and, and you know made statements about how they support the black community against racism or any form of police brutality. Um, one example of the anti-Semitism that we saw online around this issue was Ice Cube. I don't know if you guys are familiar with what happened a few weeks ago, but he's like a celebrity. Um, and he posted this um, graphic of a mural that depicts Jews controlling a Monopoly game um, being held up as you can see here by, I guess, uh, black people. And um, this, this tweet obviously prompted a lot of responses from people, from Jewish people who are actually allies against racism, um, saying, you know, this is not, <laughs> this is not acceptable. The way to support anti-racist initiatives isn't to excuse the racism or the discrimination against another minority group. Um, and he doubled down on this. He himself is a supporter of Louis Farrakhan. That's a whole nother issue with social media. Um, he's a, a very notorious anti-Semite um, in the United States, uh, but he's done a lot of activism for the black community. And so there's been a lot of uh, excusing his anti-Semitic, explicitly anti-Semitic comments. I mean, he, he calls Jews termites, like very, very vile content. And he posts it online. Twitter doesn't remove him. Um, it's been an ongoing problem. Um, but Ice Cube is an ally of Louis Farrakhan, so it's not that surprising that he posted this comment. The most disturbing um, thing about this type of content is the responses. So, for example, I myself responded like, you know, we are not your enemy. Um, and I got, my just myself, I got 126 responses. And here is an example of the type of responses that I got. Jews are responsible for slavery. Jews were slave owners. Yes, you are the enemy horrible, horrible anti-Semitic stuff. I reported at least 20 of them so far, none of them that I know of. I like Twitter notifies you when a content, when you report has been removed. Um, so far, none of them have been removed. Um, and then the BDS movement also has latched on to the, uh, to the Black Lives Matter uh, crisis in the United States. Um, and I guess I should also mention, I didn't put it in this presentation, but Iran too took to social media immediately to criticize the United States um, about this. But the BDS group specifically, um, within hours of the protest starting after the killing of George Floyd, BDS groups and BDS activists were tweeting about how the police were trained by the IDF. Well, that's not true at all. There's no evidence to support that. Um, and then after that, we saw petitions like this one I've screenshotted here, uh, Disarm UC, this is a pro BDS group who wrote a petition to the University of California, all of the schools for all of California, um, to, to pressure them to divest from Israel because um, the knee to check, knee to neck hold chokehold that he used to murder George Floyd has been used and perfected to torture Palestinians, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, this is not true. There is no merit to this whatsoever. Even the Israeli police said there is no such tactic, nor has there ever been. It's completely unacceptable, but that doesn't mean that on social media, they aren't proliferating this content and it's, it perpetuates and contributes to anti-Semitism. So now that I've gone over a few examples of this, um, I'm just gonna go over the ways that the social media terms and the terms of use don't address these issues. Um, and, and propose an idea of how they might be able to remedy this a little bit better. Um, so all of the platforms, Twitter, Google, Facebook, which is also Instagram, um, all of them use hate speech terms, or, or not hate speech terms, they have hate speech violations. Like they have certain, a certain rubric where they judge if the content is acceptable or not acceptable. On Twitter, it's called Twitter rules. On Facebook, it's community standards. Um, on on Google, I think it's actually hate speech standards. Um, but when I looked at each of them and what's actually written and what qualifies as anti-Semitism or what qualifies as hate speech or even incitement to violence, 
um, it's really lacking when it comes to anti-Semitism because there's a lot of ways that anti-Semitism manifests today that isn't quite addressed when you talk about general hate speech. So these are four ways that not all of the platforms are addressing it. The first one is Holocaust denial. Now, let me preface this by saying that YouTube, Google, which is YouTube, has explicitly banned Holocaust denial. So if there's content that denies the Holocaust on YouTube, it will be removed according to their standards um, if they find it, which they're not very good at doing on their own, or if it's reported. However, on Facebook, that's not the case. And also on Twitter, that's not the case. It's okay to deny the Holocaust on Twitter. Um, and these are a few examples of different types of content that uh, we've seen. Um, and also Holocaust revisionism, uh, which is a whole nother issue. Um, I think if someone posts something that is outright Holocaust denial on Twitter, it may be that they remove it. It could be or it could not, which in and of itself is a problem. But if you see content like this, what AJ Pless did a video, which is which is Holocaust revisionism totally, and also talking about how the Zionist movement benefits from the Holocaust, another form of anti-Semitism. Um, Twitter and Facebook didn't remove this content at all, despite huge pushback from other people who saw this content, even people who are very critical of Israel because it's inappropriate. Um, so that's something that isn't addressed at all in their terms and something that really needs to be remedied because not only is it anti-Semitic, but it contributes to misinformation and purposeful misinformation that leads to violence of Jews, as we saw with incidents like the wave of stabbing attacks in 2015 and 2016, and how much Arabic um, incitement to violence there was against Jews and against Israelis. Um, as I mentioned, the approach between YouTube and Facebook when it comes to Holocaust denial is very different. This quote is from Mark Zuckerberg. I'm Jewish and there's a set of people who deny that the Holocaust happened. I find that deeply offensive. But at the end of the day, I don't believe that our platform should take that down because I think there are things that different people get wrong. This is mind blowing that this was his response. It's totally off base. Uh, Holocaust denial should absolutely be banned by Facebook and by all social media. Um, and it's not even an issue of free speech. It's an issue of incitement and purposeful misinformation. And if Facebook is trying to take, active, to take an active role in preventing uh, fake news and misinformation as they claim that they are, especially now with the new Facebook Oversight Board, um, they really need to re reassess their approach to this because it's a huge problem and we see how it manifests in real life, unfortunately. Um, the second form of anti-Semitism is anti-Semitic tropes. As I mentioned, a lot of times, not a lot of times, I've never seen anti-Semitic tropes removed by the social media networks because it just doesn't quite fit into their rubric of what anti-Semitism is. Um, and, and again, th the results are the same. You're continuing to perpetuate conspiracy theories, you're continuing to perpetuate misinformation about Jews, and all of this is spreading hatred and creating a culture that builds hostility to the Jewish people. And these are just a few examples. I mentioned Louis Farrakhan before. This is an example of the tweet itself. Um, after many, many, many articles in the international press about this tweet, Twitter removed it, but only then. Um, every time social media networks have made an improvement in combating online anti-Semitism, it's been way after the fact. I think there needs to be a totally new approach to that, and they need to be much more proactive about identifying and combating anti-Semitism on their network because it's one of the biggest problems with anti-Semitism today, how it's proliferated and used um, online to, to build even communities of anti-Semitism. Um, another example here is uh, Sarah Lee Whitson, who was from, she was the former, I think, regional director. I'm not sure what her title was with Human Rights Watch. She's no longer there, she's with something else. But after a, a very left-wing Israeli journalist tweeted this, um, about the lockdowns in Israel. This was her response. Um, again, this is another anti-Semitic trope about blood libels. Um, there's no way that this would fall under the existing, um, under the existing community standards of these social media networks, despite the fact that it is very anti-Semitic. Um, the third area is conspiracy theories, which I mentioned a little bit before. We see lots and lots of this content, especially with coronavirus. It really came to a, a peak um, and, and from all different directions, from all different countries, individuals, even leaders, um, celebrities were tweeting about this. Um, 
And obviously there's no truth to it. <laughs> Israel did not create the coronavirus in order to make money or any of the other conspiracy theories that we saw. Um, but this content isn't eligible uh, to be removed in most cases, and that's dangerous. Um, and then finally, the whole anti-Zionism is an anti-Semitism approach, which I mentioned at the very beginning. A lot of times we see content that's masked um, as criticism of Israel um, that actually is just straight up anti-Semitism. Um, here is one example of someone very upset that their account was suspended because they called for Zionists to die. Um, it, interestingly enough, this person's Twitter wasn't suspended under the, you know, on the grounds that they are spreading hate speech against like a minority group, rather that they called for someone to die. So it was like a threat to violence. Um, I think that there, again, needs to be a new approach in how they um, deal with the Zionism versus anti-Semitism. And there needs to be some acknowledgement and some explicit terms on the, on the part of the networks to recognize that a lot of times when, when you see anti-Zionist, supposedly, content, it actually is just anti-Semitism. And that requires a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of nuance. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I've advocated quite a bit and written quite extensively now about how I think that the social media platforms should be adopting uh, the definition of IRA, the IRA's definition of anti-Semitism into their platforms, um, or at least part of it, because there needs to be um, a proactive approach and they should have people within their uh, within their teams who are dealing with this proactively. Um, if they're able to identify uh, content that is hateful against other groups, which they do, which they have been pretty vigilant about, then they should be able to do this with anti-Semitism as well. And unfortunately, it just hasn't happened until now. Um, and then the last few examples that I have, just more examples of anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism masquerading as anti-Zionism. Um, there was a video posted by Students for Justice in Palestine uh, at a university where, and I can't believe that they posted this and thought this was acceptable, but they had one of their activists harass a Holocaust survivor um, who is not Israeli um, and ask him, actually demanded that he condemn Israel's actions. Um, again, holding Jews responsible who are not Israeli citizens, who are not a part of the army, who are not policymakers, is anti-Semitism. Um, so this, again, the same, the same issue. Um, I think I had a few, even though I think this content is actually quite demonstrative of the problem with groups like SJP, um, this content wasn't removed when it was reported. Um, so again, this is, this is a big problem and, and I don't believe that the networks are taking it seriously enough um, and definitely not proactively enough and that is it. So if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer them. I tried to go through it as quickly as I could so that I can get to your questions, but um, yeah. Thank you very much, Emily. That was really fantastic. Hi everyone, I'm Naomi Levine. I work for AJAC. Um, and I actually met Emily at a conference that discussed these issues in Israel uh, in March last year. Um, and Emily was also a really great assistance to AJAC earlier this year. And we had some issues with actually a far right attack on our own AJAC Facebook page. So she was really helpful in giving advice. So thank you for your presentation, Emily. And we know from experience uh, how effective your work in this area is, so thank you. I just wanted to ask, I mean, you could do any job in the world, you're wonderful. Why have you chosen to get involved in fighting anti-Semitism on social media? I mean, it's a pretty gruelling thing to get up and do every day. Um, so I, I actually got involved in this field in the first place interestingly enough, because of Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, I did my undergrad at USC, University of Southern California. Um, and at the time they had a fairly active um, pro-Palestinian group. I, I don't like even calling them that because in reality they're not pro-Palestinian at all. They're anti-Israel. Um, and I remember that I was there, I was a political science major, I was very involved in politics and I saw their apartheid wall. Um, and I remember asking my friend like, what is wrong with these people? Like, why do they care so much? Why are they so obsessed? And she was like, oh, maybe you should get involved with the Students for Israel. And I was like, mm, I don't know if I have time. Well, I did. And then it sort of took off from there. Um, and that's how I, I got involved. And with social media, um, I actually worked, I did a lot of digital work on political campaigns. Um, so I was very familiar with the environment. And it was only after I sort of combined the two worlds that I realized like, wow, 
there's really something here. Um, and I understood, because I understood how they worked uh, early on, I understood like how to talk about it and how to engage. And I started monitoring and mapping the trends that we were seeing. And then after a few years, um, as more activity with Israel happened, like in 2012 with um, Amud Anan, Pillar of Defense. <laughs> um, Pillar of Defense, um, we saw a lot of content in Arabic and I started paying attention and getting into the Arabic social media. And that's a whole nother world of anti-Semitism online. Um, and unfortunately, as we saw in the following years, it, it has only grown um, in terms of anti-Semitism. So that's how I got involved. Um, and I think that it's, I think that it's really, really important, and quite frankly, not only for, for anti-Semitism, um, but for other forms of, of hate speech as well, because having worked in this field um, and, and working with clients now in, in the Jewish world and in not the Jewish world, um, I can tell you that uh, despite what people act like in person, um, the, the two groups that I've seen receive more hate um, than any other communities are Jews, on social media are Jews, and uh, LGBT. I don't know what it is about social media, but people feel that they have um, a license, maybe it's the degree of anonymity, to say the most heinous things about these two groups on social media. And obviously there's racism and discrimination against other groups as well, but on social media in particular, it's just, it's awful. <laughs> it's really, really awful. So. It's a really interesting observation that, that those two groups are the ones that are targeted for the most hate speech on social media and quite disheartening, I think. Why, why again, are we the ones who are being picked on? Um, I want to turn it around and look more at positives. You also do a lot of pro-Israel and pro-Jewish campaigning as well. And I wanted to ask you about some of the successful campaigns you've been involved with to spread positive messages. Um. Yeah, well, I've done a lot of campaigns, so I'm racking my brain. Um, probably, I think one of the campaigns that I'm most uh, proud of is um, during uh, Operation Protective Edge in 2014. Um, I had the idea because um, at the time where I was working, we were getting tons of um, inquiries and like private messages of support even from like weird countries that you wouldn't normally expect to be supporting israel in a situation like at the time it was like pre-war it was right after the three teenage boys were were kidnapped um and i had an idea to um ask supporters or people who messaged us to send us a picture of them um saying i support israel against hamas um and holding a picture of their passport um, this really, really took off. We ended up getting like over 2,500 submissions. We got people from 146 different countries. Um, the campaign was covered in the international press, also the Israeli press, Israeli TV. Um, and I think that in the midst of such a emotional and um, traumatic time for, for many people, whether in Israel or abroad, um, it was nice to have and to see that even if it's a minority in some of these communities. There are people, um, I mean, we even got submissions from like the West Bank, from people who had Palestinian passports. We got submissions from Iran. And, and it, what's interesting is that when these people submitted it, they would send like, sometimes they would send like very long messages about how, you know, it's not acceptable to talk this way in the place where they live, but they want Israelis to know that they are supportive of Israel and that they recognize that Hamas is not only a terrorist organization, but it's very damaging for the Palestinians. So I'm really, I'm really proud of, of that work um, in 2014. And I think that it did something good to give people a little bit of hope in like a very difficult uh, situation. It's interesting what you say, because I think just recently the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs celebrated a milestone for their Persian language foreign, um, social media, which I think it hit, and I might have got the numbers wrong, but 500,000 followers in Persian language, so assume, assuming in Iran, which is quite extraordinary that there are that many people in Iran wanting to follow what Israel's doing. And, you know, it's it's a great sign. Um, I'm going to ask one last question before I throw it open to people. So please start putting up your hands if you do have a question for Emily. Um, in your, a lot of the people who are listening today do have social media accounts and are active on social media on one of the platforms or a couple of them. In your experience, what's the most effective way um, that just a regular citizen can combat some of 
um, this anti-Semitism, the calls for boycotts for Israel, allegations of apartheid. What can people do? What's a simple thing people can do on social media um, to try and stop that spreading? Wow, that's a, that's a lot. A, a simple way? I don't know. It's a pretty big task. You're talking about. Right, one way. Let's go one way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that it, it depends how much you want to be involved. Um, and also like, it, it is true that when you're very vocal and you put yourself out there, sometimes people will leave you. Like like I gave an example in, a, in the screenshot that I put, I responded to Ice Cube's tweet and I got 126 almost exclusively anti-Semitic comments. So there's always that um, risk in my experience. And I do have a lot. Um, that isn't something that's physically risky. Um, it's just not nice. And and I will, I, I will be completely honest that it, can be very draining um, when you get a lot of really nasty comments, even if it's from like losers who are sitting in their parent, you know, their, their parents' basement and are just anti-Semites. Um, but what's upsetting is that there's so many people who hold those views. And unfortunately you see that on social media. Now that being said, um, if you don't care like me, go for it, be as active as you can, report anytime you see this anti-Semitic comments, um, join other pro-Israel groups like ActIL, for example, they even have an app where they put in tasks um, uh, of content that's anti-Semitic or even content that's not quite right on how they report Israel. Maybe it's an article from the New York Times or BBC, and they'll have people go and comment on social media or comment on these articles to correct the misinformation. Now, what's interesting about this is the way that social media algorithms work is that when you post a comment on a Facebook post or, or you respond to a tweet, the more retweets or the more likes that comment itself gets, the higher it displays on the page. So if there's an article that's from uh, the New York Times that isn't quite right about Israel and you have someone who writes a very uh, well-reasoned response with factual data and links proving their points and explaining why they're wrong, you're better off liking that comment and even responding to that comment instead of the article than you are responding yourself. Because the more people who like that comment, the higher it will display. And then, even when someone who doesn't support Israel shares that post, that's going to be the first comment that they see. So that should be the goal in how you interact on social media, understanding how these networks work and amplifying as much as you can um, the content that's correct, the content that's calling out anti-Semitism. And I do think, I will say that I think anti-Semitism on social media and anti-Israel activity like the example I gave with New York Times um, are a little bit different and, and the approaches should be different as well. So if you see content that's incorrect about Israel, um, it's better to respond and to engage and to support other comments and other people who are engaging with that content. If it's anti-Semitic, the best thing that you can do is not respond because you don't want that amplified. Um, report it to the network itself. Each network has like a thing, I think, there's like a little three dots and you can click on it and then report it. There, it guides you through the steps depending on the platform. So the best thing is to report it. Wait until you get a response. Usually it's one or two days. And if they removed it, great. If they didn't remove it, um, work with other pro-Israel groups that uh, you have. That's why I encourage you to join pro-Israel uh, networks or apps or whatever. There's a lot of them. Um, and ask other people to do the same, number one. And number two, if it's on Facebook, tweet about it if, if Facebook refused to remove it. And tag Facebook. If it's on Twitter, post it on Facebook. So use your other social media networks to call out these networks because multiple times I reported something on Facebook. Facebook has said it doesn't violate community standards. So I screenshotted them saying that doesn't violate community standards. And when I tweeted it, two hours later, it was removed by Facebook. So they do pay attention uh, to what the chatter is. And the more chatter you can make without inadvertently promoting the anti-Semitic content, the better results you're going to have. Thank you. And I'll just remind everyone who's listening now that um, Ajak posts a lot of uh, content that we would love for you to amplify. So calling out anti-Semitism and those sorts of things. So if you're ever looking for a way to contribute, please share Ajak posts on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And that's a great, a great place to start. Um, I'm going to go to some questions now. The first question I've got is from Sharon Mittelman. Hi, Emily. Thanks so much for your presentation. 
Uh, you mentioned that a lot of right-wing groups and white supremacists are moving to Gab and the dark net, net when they're um, moved off Facebook and Twitter and other mainstream platforms. How do you think we should respond to um, platforms like Gab and do you think that states should be enacting laws to protect people from hate speech? Um, so generally speaking, I'm pretty, from the perspective of the government, I'm pretty... I'm pretty hands off. I, I don't really support a lot of government uh, intervention on that. However, I think that each of these platforms like Gab and 4chan and, and even Telegram, um, they're hosted places, uh, like as in their websites are hosted. And I do think that that is fair game to pressure those networks to um, remove that content. Um, because the thing, the thing that people get confused about with Facebook and Twitter and Gab and all of them is that these are private companies. These aren't government entities and they don't have an obligation uh, to protect free speech. They can set whatever standards they like. Um, and I think that that's fair game for lobbying them, for lobbying them to pay attention to hate speech issues. Um, and, you know, part of the reason Mark Zuckerberg's comment was so outlandish, from my perspective at least, is that like, he is not a, a elected government body. You know, he isn't bound by the U.S. Constitution and their interpretation of free speech. He's the CEO of Facebook, and he's within his rights to say this is unacceptable content because it promotes A, B, C, D, and that causes problems in society, as we know. Um, and I think that your best bet is approaching these networks from a, a private perspective and approaching the people who allow them to operate at like in the case of Gap or 4chan. That being said, I think that governments need to do more to work with those networks and to, I guess, lobby uh, those, those platforms in order to crack down on issues that result in or explicitly call for violence. Um, and I think that there's a case to be made that in many times, if not all, but in many times, um, the hate speech that we see with anti-Semitism and also some other groups does lead to violence. Um, and there is a clear path that demonstrates that. Um, for example, perfect example is with the Arabic content and the stabbing attacks. Time after time after time after time, we saw that people would post some, you know, Palestinian, usually a young Palestinian would post something on social media. And then two hours later, they would go out and try to stab a soldier. So there is a direct link between radicalization and real life consequences and real life violence. And I think that that is where the state comes in and where they have an obligation to work very closely with these networks in developing policies that are okay enough with what those networks want to promote, but that they also fall within um, their responsibilities as, as a corporation in the countries where they operate. If that makes sense. It certainly makes sense. Thank you, Emily. We're going to go to Anthony Cohen next for a question. Thank you, Emily, for your um, uh, talk. Um, just a couple of matters of, I think, that are fact. A lot of these people are young. I don't think the young people today are interested in facts at all. They just see a, uh, an area they want to go to. They're not interested whether it's right or wrong. It's sort of mob rule and anyone else in the way uh, is wrong. Uh, and the other thing is, there's a little doubt, you know, with social media, that bad things spread much more than good things. A suggestion I'll make is that one of the things that can neutralize these sort of things to some extent is the use of humor. If you can get a good cartoonist uh, or several cartoonists to just show the hypocrisy of some of these people, you know, like you see the Ayatollahs out throwing stones, you know, stoning a woman to death and saying, gosh, it's terrible what these Zionists do, you know, uh, you know, or, and all things like that. Um, I think that as a countermeasure can be somewhat effective um i do i do agree with you take it as a comment or do you want to respond up to you uh no i will respond i do think that comedy is a great way for uh combating the trends that we see on social media um a good example that i saw is actually in arabic because there's a lot of um 
like really dramatic overreactions to Israel's actions and the things that Jews or Israel do on Arabic social media. And I saw an account, um, I don't know if it's still active on Facebook, but it was called the Zionist Sarcasm Society. And basically it took screenshots of different uh, Arabic movies or Arabic TV shows and added captions to them that were making fun of how uh, Arabic government leaders perceive and talk about Israel. So like one of them would say, um, you know, we, we don't work with Israel and they're the evil Zionist entity. And then like the second caption would say like, oh, but like they made our computers, like, like making fun of how ridiculous um, what they do is. So I, I do agree with you. And that got tons of traction. Of course, there's people who are like, no, Israel's evil in the comments, but it was effective and it got across. Um, and I do think that that's a good tactic. That's, um, that's a little bit more difficult for like your everyday person to emulate unless you know, it comes naturally to them. Um, so that's a, that's a content creation type, um, type comment, but I definitely agree with you. Definitely. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here from Vic Aladef, who's one of our community leaders in Sydney. Um, and he submitted it by email. I recently attended a Zoom discussion hosted by the American Jewish Committee on how Facebook deals with this issue. And the speaker made a big deal about an oversight board, which Facebook has introduced, which you have written about Emily in the Jerusalem Post. Um, this oversight board appears to be powerless when it comes to people posting messages such as the Holocaust was a hoax. History is always written by the winners. Um, and he was interested in your thoughts on the power of this oversight board over content like that. Um, yeah, so Facebook implemented an oversight board just a month ago, two months ago, I wanna say, and they announced the first 20 of what's intended to be 40 people who have a like ultimate oversight over content policies. So basically it's like the Supreme Court of Facebook, uh, meaning that they are, they can overrule Facebook's uh, existing policies on certain content. Um, and the idea behind this is that they can promote um, human rights or protect human rights um, online even when it conflicts with Facebook's uh, business interest, or even when it theoretically could conflict with Facebook business interest. So there's a few problems with the board itself. First off, some of the people on the board are very questionable. Uh, they have someone who is a, they do have some, um, some great people actually on the list. Um, they, I think they have two Israelis um, as well, uh, but they also have someone who was a Nobel Peace Prize laureate from um, Yemen, and she uh, was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood Party there. She's also a huge ally of Qatar and Turkey, also states who are very uh, actively promoting Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and even since um, her work that she did in Yemen, she's been very strongly criticized for being anti-free uh, speech. So I don't, I'm not sure that that's like a, a great person to have on your content oversight board. It's not someone I would trust to really delve into the nuances of anti-Semitism. I think that the thought behind the Facebook oversight, oversight board is uh, it's not a bad idea. But again, back to what I said about Facebook not being a government, um, they're not a country, you know? <laughs> they don't need a Supreme Court. They need to make decisions about how to proactively address some of the trending issues that they have whether that be misinformation, whether that be not adequately dealing with uh, racism and, and hateful comments about gays or anti-Semitism. Um, and they are well within their rights to say whatever, what, set whatever terms that they want to say. Um, and I think that um, Zuckerberg needs to do a better job of uh, taking that on as a company themselves and not paying an external body uh, $140 million a year to do oversight um, and, and have them be able to control over the company what type of content can be on social media. Um, it, it could be good, it could. It, it also could be really, really bad. So that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna go quickly to Jeremy Samuel. Jeremy, if you can keep your question nice and brief because we're really running out of time. We've got a couple more questions we still need to get through. So Jeremy Samuel. Sure. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, disturbing though it is. Um, you said something uh, which pricked my ears, which is that Facebook and Twitter are private companies. Um, no, they're not. They're listed companies. Um, 
why aren't people organizing shareholder activism to push this issue at annual general meetings and and amongst the shareholders of those companies who actually have a lot of sway over who sits on their board and how they're run? Um, what I meant by private companies is that they're non-governmental. <laughs> Obviously, I know that they're public, um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that that would be a great strategy. Um, it's not really related to things that you can do, individuals can do on social media, um, so I didn't really bring it up, but that is something that absolutely should, could and should be done, definitely. Thank you. Thanks very much for the question. Um, we're just going to go to Svee Fleisch now for another quick question before I hand over to Jeremy Jones to finish up the evening. Svee, you're up. All right, I'm going to ask you a big question. I'm going to ask a short answer. Um, which is which is the biggest problem at the moment? Just in in a few words, is it the far left or the far right? Where should we, if we if we had to only concentrate on one, which would you concentrate on when it comes to the anti-Semitism and other problems on on social media? That's a hard one. <laughs> That's a really hard one. Um, I, I honestly, I, it's different for different platforms. Um, I think that the far right is more active on um, Twitter, um, and in terms of mobilization and uh, growing their groups, they're more active on non-traditional, I guess, platforms. Not Twitter, not Facebook. Like they're more on Gab. Um, so I think that that's a bigger problem um, on Twitter, from what I see. Um, and um, Facebook, I think you have a bigger problem in Arabic um, and also on the left from uh, BDS and anti-Israel groups. But that being said, like there is, the, like the examples that I stated, like there's examples of anti-Semitic tropes, of conspiracy theories, of um, anti-Zionism versus anti-Semitism in all of these groups. Uh, so I would say it's more based on like the type of content and the messaging that they're promoting rather than from which side it's coming from if that makes sense. It just happens to be that um, on Twitter, there's a ton of neo-Nazis, like a ton. That's why in, in response to my tweet, I got like hundreds of comments in response, so. Quite alarming, Emily. And unfortunately, that wasn't the answer. I suppose we wanted to hear that it's all bad. I'm gonna hand over now to Jeremy Jones, who's AJX International Director, just for a final question and then to wrap it up. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, we're very interested not just in who gets the most likes, who's the loudest, but in changing minds and influencing people. And I just wondered what your assessment is, is are people's minds being changed actively? And if so, how are we going? How are the anti-anti-Semites going? Are we changing minds by using social media? Um, again, you guys are asking such hard questions. <laughs> I, I do think it makes a difference. And it makes a difference beca because despite the fact that um, the pro-Israel side is very, very outnumbered and all of social media at the end of the day is a numbers game. That's how the algorithms work. Um, that's what they reward, uh, how much engagement it is, how much uh, views there are, how many retweets there are. Um, but the alternative, if we don't engage, is that they have a monopoly on the conversation where many, many, young people are where the majority of the next generation is getting their news and getting their information. Um, so I do think that we are constantly growing and developing new ways to strategize and to get around the problems that we see. It's not enough. Uh, we need to be more active. And you can't expect that, um, you know, in two years, oh, the pro-Israel side will be much get better and, and anti-Semitism will all be stopped. I, I think that's somewhat unrealistic because there's not I mean, at the end of the day, there's not that many Jews in the world. Um, so, and people, it's not all about us. You know, there, there are other issues that people care about and people talk about. Um, but the alternative is that we don't have a voice at all. And that's a much, much worse and much more dangerous alternative. So that's why I always encourage people, even people who aren't such big fans of social media, to engage as much as they can, um, as much as they're comfortable with, but to engage as much as they can because it's important and you never know who's going to see your response to a very biased or unfair article uh, that mischaracterizes something that the IDF recently did. You don't know. You don't know who's gonna see that and who it's gonna affect. And having worked in this field for a very long time, I have gotten messages um, from people who have seen like small things or little posts here or there that changed the way that they that they saw things or changed the way that they looked into the information and the facts about a certain issue. Um, and that's important. 
uh, it's important to be out there. It's important to be visible, and it's important to um, to to say the truth when you when you know the truth, and to fight back when you see lies. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Emily. That was a really amazing uh, seminar. I really appreciate it.